Hello everyone, today I'm looking at Greg Kokel of Stand to Reason, who I haven't responded to in so long you might not even remember who he is. And that's not because I stopped being interested in him. This is one of the channels I check in with occasionally to see if there's any interesting content, but the problem is there just isn't, usually anymore. But for once, I did find something that I consider kind of interesting on the channel, and I find it interesting because it's a response to a question that comes up fairly often in my videos. This video is called, Why Did God Create the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil? Why would God put the tree in the garden to start with? Yeah, that's the question, thank you. It's a bit annoying because there's no video, I don't think there ever is a video with this STR ask stuff, so we're just gonna have to put up with it. Well, this is a good question, it's a fair question, and um, the way I characterize it in the story of reality, and, and it, by the way, there's a, there is a, this is a kind of a judgment call. It, it isn't like we have clear characterizations of this in Scripture, it's all explained. Certain things are explained, rather clearly. Other things are just there, and we kind of scratch our heads and we wonder, okay? Oh, I know. There's an awful lot in Genesis, especially the early parts, where maybe the story and the motivations of the characters and the reasons things happen were clear to the people who were telling these stories to each other thousands of years ago, but the version that survived is so point form and so minimalistic and takes so much of your understanding for granted that it hardly makes sense anymore, assuming it ever did. Which raises the question of why this ultra-important source of knowledge from God himself would be subject to these kind of problems, but I guess that's a question for another day. But um, I think characteristically, the reflections on that issue amount to there is nothing, in a certain sense, inherent about the fruit of that tree itself. But it was inherent uh, what was in, but what what was meaningful was the act towards God regarding a prohibition. Well, yeah, I get that, that it wasn't specifically about the tree. It could have been anything. It could have been, don't flick the jaguar on the nose, don't do a handstand, and the story would have been basically the same. At least as far as the obedience part is concerned, the do what I tell you or I'm gonna punish you part. There is one thing that makes it more important that the order concerns the tree specifically, and that's Genesis 3.22, where God expresses his worry that Adam is now like one of the gods, knowing good and evil, and if he's allowed to also eat from the tree of life and become immortal, he could presumably become a god himself and pose some competition. And it's this fear on the part of God that's why they were actually banished, according to the story. It's still pretty weird that he put these trees in the garden at all if he was so utterly terrified of this outcome that he knew was gonna happen. It's almost as though the character of God in these old stories is just a bumbling idiot who got hold of a little bit more power than he knows what to do with, maybe by eating from a couple of trees himself, rather than this all-knowing, all-powerful, transcendent being people want to imagine today. But if you want to just ignore that extremely inconvenient verse and pretend it's all about God's boner for obedience and not his fear, I'll go with that. It makes the story far, far, far worse. Maybe not theologically, but definitely in terms of God's character. And if that's the way you want it, I'm fine with that. So back to the question about why God put the tree in the garden. The real question is, why would you set up the situation this way at all? Why would you create people with no understanding of what good or bad even means? Good apparently meaning obedience to God, and bad meaning disobedience. They haven't eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil yet, so they don't have that knowledge yet. They're utterly naive on the subject. And then you put a serpent on the tree whose entire point is to lure them into eating from the tree. A serpent you created. There's no reason for them to think that this serpent that you put there to tell them what you want it to tell them is going to tell them anything other than what you want them to hear. Stuff that's in accordance with your will. I mean, you made the thing. You stick that there to talk them into doing something essentially on your behalf, and then they do it, and you're not surprised because you're God, you knew they were going to do it, but for some some reason you're upset? If it was just going to upset you, why did you bother in the first place? Why didn't you just not do the thing you find upsetting? Basically, these questions about why the tree was even in the garden at all are trying to drive at the point that this fall of man that supposedly man is 100% responsible for is, in actuality, the plan and responsibility of God. God made it that way, knowing it was going to be that way. He intentionally rigged it against Adam and Eve, and punished them insanely harshly 
for losing a rigged game that they never had any hope of winning, because it was already predestined with absolute certainty by God. He made humanity for it to fall, and he made the tree and the serpent in the tree to make humanity fall. And if he in his absolute knowledge realized that's not enough to make humanity fall, he probably would have added more stuff to make sure of it. Just keep altering the plan for the universe before you even make it, until that plan for the universe ends up with humanity falling in the first generation. It's a setup. It's a game. It's entertainment. But hey, maybe you have a different take on the story. Maybe you'll convince me that my interpretation isn't correct. Guess we'll find out. Up until that time, there was moral innocence. All right. All right. So by moral innocence, you mean absolute obedience. They hadn't disobeyed any order yet. There wasn't... M in a deep sense, moral purity, there wasn't like a, an immutable moral goodness. That would be what God has, and that he, he then, in, in my view at least, in Amy's view, um, he, he uh, delivers to us at the resurrection. So it's, it's a communicable attribute, and we, be, we become holy by nature, at the resurrection. That is a really interesting idea. So up until the resurrection, humanity is not holy by nature, not even before the fall. So the fall didn't change anything about our nature. We were unholy before it, and we were unholy after it by nature. All that changed in the fall was that before it, nobody had disobeyed God, and after it, somebody had disobeyed God. So despite being unholy by nature before the fall, Adam and Eve wouldn't go to heaven, wouldn't go to hell, anything, because they wouldn't die at all. So whether you die, whether you go to heaven or hell, is not an issue of your nature. It's an issue of your personal actions, your personal moral innocence, or lack thereof. And yet apparently the point of the resurrection was to make us holy by nature. Us seemingly meaning all of us. Since the resurrection, we've been holy by nature. Which is great, except for the fact that holiness or unholiness of nature has nothing to do with whether you die or go to heaven or go to hell. I'm curious what meaningful difference there is at all between a person who's holy by nature and a person who isn't. I mean, apparently I'm holy by nature, and apparently someone before the time of the resurrection was unholy by nature, but I suspect that doesn't have much difference in the outcome when the outcome is determined by whether you believe in Jesus, which I guess has no impact whatsoever on your nature, but resets you to a state of moral innocence or something. Even though you're almost certainly not innocent, you've committed some kind of a sin according to Christianity. But I guess it makes God pretend you're innocent. It makes him decide he's going to look the other way. Which, if he was going to do that, he could have just done it right from the start and avoided this entire debacle. Maybe I'm just a big idiot, but I find this all very convoluted. Maybe you'll clarify as we go forward and I'll find out that, okay, it does make sense. It won't. It's not going to happen. Adam and Eve weren't holy by nature, they were holy by practice. Right, okay, so they were holy because they didn't do anything not holy yet, anything sinful yet. But we are holy by nature. And I forgot to mention, earlier you defined holy by nature as having an immutable moral goodness, which only God had before the resurrection, after which every human had. And if we're immutably morally good, we are completely sanitized of all the badness, we're like God now, since the resurrection. Resurrection. I don't really understand all the talk Christians have about people sinning and being fallen by nature and all this kind of stuff, because it's not true, apparently. No, we're all godly. We're immutably good. We're fundamentally different from Adam and Eve, incapable of sin. We're not holy by practice. We're holy by nature. I mean, if that's what the resurrection did, problem solved. Why are we even having this conversation anymore? All this talk about morality and good actions and bad actions, that all faded into the past a couple thousand years ago at this point. But maybe that's not what you mean. Okay, almost certainly that's not what you mean. In which case, I don't know why you say it like that's what you mean. But you do. In other words, it was possible for them to sin. And it was possible for them not to sin. Right, and it's impossible for us to sin. Thanks, Jesus. I'm going to go drink and swear and stick dongles in my butthole now and be as morally pure and righteous as God while I do it. All right. Huh. All right. Rock on, brother. As what happened, though, is when they ate from the tree, then they disobeyed God. And um, in the story of reality, what, what I, the way I characterize this is that it was a, it was a, an an opportunity, 
a way that they could express fidelity to God. I'm assuming the story of reality is one of his books. I'm not even going to look that up because who cares? So setting up the tree in this way was just an opportunity. It was an opportunity to show absolute unquestioning obedience at all times without ever slipping up once for all of eternity. And then on purpose setting up temptations which he knows with absolute certainty will cause you to slip because he made your nature. He knows your every weakness and knew your exact future before you ever existed. And he put outright tricks in the garden to to ensure that even if the temptation he knew you'd fall for, in accordance with the nature of you that he made, somehow still doesn't cause you to fall, then he has a backup plan, because what's better than absolute certainty that he's gonna succeed at fucking you? being absolutely certain, and having a backup just in case. And if they did slip up, they would be subjected to death and pain and misery and suffering and eternal torture in hell. Wow, I mean, fuck, what an opportunity. Holy cow, I, I'm sure I'm glad that I don't need these opportunities, being perfectly morally pure and godly. Sounds about as good as being given an opportunity to jump in a vat of acid. Like, wow, thanks. All right. All right. It, it's hard to express fidelity um, and faithfulness to someone uh, when you are not tested in that faithfulness, making a choice in favor of that one as opposed to something else. Right. So again, we come back to it being this game. God creates these creatures having known exactly what was going to happen from before he created them. And then he sets up this weird situation designed to make them fuck up and puts it forth like as if it's a loyalty test. No, I just want to make sure you'll absolutely obey me all the time. I got to be sure. I don't know. I'm going to test you and push you and mess with you until you screw up. And then I'll know that you're not really loyal. And then I'll be justified in doing anything I want to you. I got curious on Greg's opinion about how omniscience exactly works. Whether God really knows the future in his view, whether God would know what happened in the universe before he ever created the universe for it to happen in, whether God would know the answer to different counterfactuals, such as, if I do this, that will happen, but if I do this other thing, then that other thing will happen, and only one of them is the actual outcome in the future, one of them will never actually happen, but it's still true that if I do this, then that will happen. Would God know all those alternative counterfactual possibilities the same way he knows the actual future? So the best I could find was this article from his website by him in 2013, which, okay, a bit old, but I'll take it, I guess, because that's what I have. And it says, the best way to state or define the nature of God's omniscience is that God knows and believes every true proposition, which is pretty definitively clear. God does know the counterfactuals. He does know what will happen in the universe before it's ever created. You can say, if God did this, then that would happen. Even if he doesn't do it, it's still a true proposition, and therefore God knows the answer. So again, before God ever created the universe, he had literally every possibility for how it could go laid out before him, and he handpicked this one. He chose and on purpose created a universe that would result in the fall of humanity. He could have created any universe, including ones where humans' nature just made them never want to disobey God, made them want to have fidelity to God, made them never slip up by their own supposed free will, which, frankly, in this kind of a setup doesn't exist, but according to the Christians, somehow it does. But instead, God looked at all these possible universes and went, okay, those ones where everything's fine, where none of this ever happens, I don't want that. I'm going to take this one where the way that I create this universe causes a horrific outcome just because billions of people burning in hell forever and ever. Yeah, that's what I meant to. So not only did he start off his relationship with these people by doing a sadistic loyalty test like you get with an abusive partner, with the stakes not being something like getting a beating at the end, which would be bad enough, but infinitely worse than that. It was a loyalty test with literally no way for these people to succeed because God had absolute control and power over the entire situation. Before anything beyond himself existed, he chose a universe where they were predestined to make this slip up. They weren't fighting against their own urges or their own nature. They were fighting against the fate handed down by God. They were fighting against God. The only way for them to obey God would be for them to perform the ultimate act of disobedience by somehow subverting all 
all of his power and control and will and doing something other than the only thing they were able to do within the universe as it was created by him. The only two choices of these naive, powerless, naked newborns were disobey God's command or defeat God. Beat God at his own game of predestination despite you being predestined not to. And perform this opposition, this ultimate form of disobedience, just to give yourself a chance to obey. There's no third option, and even that second option is not really an option, because it's completely impossible, and of course, nonsensical, self-contradictory. The fact that people try to defend this story, the fact that people look at the character of God in it and go, yeah, I love that guy, he's great, is disgraceful. But hey, I guess their opinions on the matter were predestined from before the start too, so I can't really blame them, can I? Well, if they're right, anyway. And uh, I was thinking about this notion the other day, you know, we have friends that that uh, we love, all right? Um, and I'm just, just thinking of spousal relationships, okay? Spousal relationships have lots of liabilities to them, obviously, because you're living together, and it just always it brings out the best and worst of us. Um, but, um, but we may have friends that, that love us, but, but that love has never been tested because it never costs them anything in many cases. So for the friend that loves the spouse— in question, how many times has that that friend of theirs, the spouse, injured the friend who loves them? Oh, they've never done anything wrong. They've always been great. Well, see, then your love hasn't cost you that much. It isn't. I'm not saying it's not real love. It just hasn't cost you. But the spouse who continues to love, when they've been injured, that love costs something. Okay, that is a greater love. A bit of a longer clip, but it needed to be. So to start with, when Greg says injured, he doesn't mean physically injured. He means hurt in some way, wronged in some way. You got in a fight with your spouse. You said things you didn't mean. Maybe one of you does something that's not very nice. But you love each other. You work it out. You move on. You put it in the past. At first, it's a bad time, but then things settle out, and then they go back to normal. Maybe you're even a little bit stronger for it as a couple. Maybe you've learned something more about each other, how to get along with each other, or boundaries or whatever. Maybe you've learned some of each other's weak points. Things not to push on, things not to bring up, or ways not to bring them up. And that, he says, makes love stronger than if you just have a friend who you get along with, but you don't have these kind of issues with because maybe you don't spend enough time with them to have these issues, or maybe your relationship's not close enough or emotional enough to have this kind of stuff come up. You know, you give each other canned goods and vegetables and Christmas cards and you talk about your kids, and there you go, not much room for conflict. Now, I'll agree with that. I think that spouses do fight, and those fights can lead to you understanding each other better and having more of a connection, even though it feels bad at the time. Obviously assuming that these fights stay within reason and aren't all the time, and you're actually doing something to try to resolve the stuff. So I understand how this relates to real-life relationships. What confuses me is how this applies in any way whatsoever to the story we're talking about. Because in the story we're talking about, there's no understanding of, okay, we might step on each other's toes, we might occasionally have problems, offend each other in some way that we didn't mean to, or make a mistake, or, you know, not understand how important some request the other person made is, and not pay as much attention to it at first as we should. No, this story is, one of the partners says, I am in absolute control, and you will absolutely obey every command I give you unquestioningly, and never make a mistake for the eternity you will be alive without dying or I'm going to kill you. That's the start of it. And then the other partner slips up anyway. And so the first partner says, okay, look, you did one thing wrong, and therefore I am going to kill you. I'm also going to kill all of your descendants. I'm going to subject all of you to extreme pain and childbirth. I'm going to kick you out of this garden where food grows plentifully and make you grow thistles from the soil. And although this isn't explicitly stated, it is in Christian theology, Greg's theology very much included. I've made videos on his opinion and Tim Barnett's opinion about this, before. Once you and all of your descendants die, I'm going to torture you forever and ever in hell. Zero attempt at reconciliation, zero attempt to repair the love, zero attempt to move on from this or try to make the relationship stronger because of this, no attempt to talk, no attempt to work together, no attempt to find common ground. In fact, no action taken which reflects any love at all. Only relentless, infinite 
hatred. This isn't what you'd do with your wife, Greg, if you got in a fight with her once. Hell, if she questioned you once. Toss her out in the middle of winter. Tell her, yeah, okay, I'm the one with the job, but you can go provide for yourself now. You and the kids. Get out. Go turn over some dirt. See what thistles you can grow. Eat those. And I'll keep an eye on you, and eventually, after some random period of time, you don't know how long, I'll track you down and kill you by setting you on fire. And then you slam the door and go call a security company to send some guy over with a flaming sword to guard the door so they can't get back in. Wow, such love. I mean, look how much stronger your relationship is becoming as a result of this. Gee, it sure is a good thing for everyone involved that your wife had this opportunity to show her fidelity to you. Everyone's life was so much improved by this. Well, maybe yours was anyway, because at least you got your kicks out of it, right? Not 100% sure about her, but I guess who cares? She's not the ruler of this relationship. What the hell does she matter? And the kids, I mean, they matter even less. They're getting kicked out and put in the same situation, and they didn't even do anything. They didn't have a thing to do with this argument. They weren't even at home at the time. And you know what's really sad about this is, using human examples like this, I can't make it as bad as the Christian story. It's not possible, because no matter how much one human suffers at the hands of another human, there's some limit to the severity severity and duration of the suffering. It's actually not possible, no matter how hard you try, for you as a human to be as bad to another person as your God is to everyone. And this is love. All of this was done for love. To make the relationship better. That's your excuse? That's what you expect me to hold my nose and choke down and then smile and tell you was wonderful? Wow, such a good explanation, Greg. That addresses all of my concerns. You have such a kind and loving and inspiring religion. And, uh, and so the, 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 the testing of the love or the opportunity for testing, is what, in a certain sense, secures the meaningfulness of it. Okay, listen, if you're in a relationship and your spouse is constantly testing you, like, okay, yesterday you passed the test, today here's another loyalty test, and if you don't pass it, I'm going to beat you. Leave. Now, again, I agree that going through a few rough patches with your spouse can actually be beneficial in the end, but if it looks anything like the story in Genesis 3, no. Absolutely not. If you replaced God and Adam and Eve with a husband and a wife in that story, it doesn't show any love, and it doesn't show a healthy relationship in any way. It shows one spouse who absolutely despises the other one, who's setting up situations to find excuses to punish the other one, to hurt the other one. And it's extremely unilateral in this. You know, the victims here, Adam and Eve, yeah, okay, they, they failed to obey once. That's their horrible crime. That doesn't show that they hate God, that they want to hurt God, and it certainly does not hurt God in any real way, intentional or unintentional. Nothing in that story shows them to be the ones causing the problem. No, no matter how I look at this story, only one of these characters appears to be the problem in this relationship. And that's God. And the apologetics for this story, like we're hearing now, appear to be just desperate rationalizations for the behavior of this viciously abusive character. I think we have the answer to why God put the tree in the garden, by the way. The answer is so he would have some excuse to convince himself he was the victim. And I suppose to convince other people who read his autobiography. And it may be that something like that was going on in the garden. This is a test of fidelity, of faithfulness to a to a uh to the king to the sovereign okay then why did you bring up the example of a marriage where things can be done wrong by both parties and they both work together to try to make it up afterwards why didn't you bring up the example of a king who says off with her head as soon as his wife talks back that'd be a far more relevant analogy and of course they fail the test as if there was ever a possibility of any other outcome it's pretty hard to achieve a positive outcome for yourself when you're dealing with a partner with infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite control over the entire timeline, who created you and the entire universe that you're in, who tailor-made it on purpose in such a way that you would lose, and who levies all of this against you with a feeling of infinite hatred. And I'm sorry for those God is love people. If this isn't what infinite hatred looks like, what the hell does it look like? The surest shit is not love. Yeah, that made a mess of things. <laughs> <laughs> they got themselves into a heap of trouble, and us as well. Yeah, and again, the kids weren't even at home that day. We weren't in the garden. What did we do? But no, we're caught up in this spousal dispute too. And of course, I disagree with the characterization that they got themselves into a heap of trouble. God heaped trouble upon them. Let's keep the blame where it belongs. But I don't know, that would be my, my response. Yeah, I noticed. Why? I, I actually do think the Tree of Life 
my suspicion is, had some inherent quality that God gave it to give life, but I don't think the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had an inherent quality of being destructive. I think the thing that was destructive was the disobedience, not the nature of the fruit that was eaten. No, it wasn't the disobedience either, because just like the tree, it could have been anything that God punished. The command they were supposed to obey could have been a different command, and they could have disobeyed some other order, but just the same way, what God punished them for did not have to be disobedience at all. It's all arbitrary. It's all God deciding what he wants to punish. It's not the actions of the people that is destructive. That's not what destroyed anything. What was destructive in the story was God's desire to destroy. God didn't want things to go well. He didn't want things to last. When he found that people made a mistake and didn't obey him, he had no desire to reconcile or talk things through, or even change his mind about what his priorities were. No, he leapt immediately to what he wanted to do in the first place, which was destroy. Again, let's keep the blame where it belongs. Anyway, now Greg's co-host Amy jumps in with some comments of her own, and she talks about how people's actions reveal the truth of what's in their hearts, and so the fact that Adam and Eve acted without showing trust for God shows that they didn't really have trust in God, and that was the problem, and they should have acted as if they had trust for God by not eating from the tree, and Greg jumps in and says, yeah, especially if they faced temptation. Roughly speaking, I've already talked about that. But then right at the end of the video, Amy says something very, very interesting. And unfortunately, we don't get a response to this from Greg. The video cuts off right after her comment, but I do know what happens after this in the podcast because I found the original one. So first, let's listen to her comment, and then we'll talk about Greg's response. One thing we have to keep in mind as we're thinking about it is the fact that God knew they would fall. And we know this because he talks about Jesus, uh, his plan to die for us on the cross being before the foundation of the world. So that was not a surprise. So whatever the, the tree was meant to do, it is in light of God's overall plan that he had laid out where he, where Jesus would die for us on the cross. So she's basically making one of the main points that I was making, that God knew what was going to happen before any of this happened, before Adam and Eve existed, before the world existed. He planned it, he chose it, he wanted it. It could not have happened any other way, no matter what Adam and Eve wanted. They were predestined to do as they did. There was no choice. The universe is a movie that was written in perfect detail before Adam and Eve ever entered. They aren't even actors, they're closer to animated characters. Procedurally controlled ones, just following a program that was made for them in advance. This is absolutely damning, as far as I'm concerned. And she says it so casually, while dumping a whole bag of wrenches into the gears. And this leaves Greg with an awful lot to clean up. So what's his response? Well, let me back up a few seconds to remind you of what Amy said at the end, and then I'll just let it play into Greg's response. That was not a surprise. So whatever the, the tree was meant to do... It is in light of God's overall plan that he had laid out where he, where Jesus would die for us on the cross. So I think there are a lot of things to think about here, and I, I think you've given some, some good things to think about, Greg. Thank you. All right, let's go to a question from... Yeah, so now we know why the video was cut off, because his response in the actual podcast is pretty much the same as it is in the video. Nothing. Do they not realize there's a problem here? Do they not care? Do they think it's not going to be obvious? I don't know. But they just move on to something else. Okay then, well apparently this major point has been made by me and Amy, and is undisputed by Greg. I guess I'll just take the win and move on. <laughs> Well, okay, thanks for watching. If you would, before you go, please do give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. If you like the channel, please consider supporting. Even a couple bucks a month helps a huge amount. And I want to give enormous thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. If you want early access, sign up to the email list at list.logic.com. And I'll see you next time.